Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast series on the topic of onboarding in emergency medicine. My name is Steve Jamison, and I am an emergency medicine trained and boarded physician with more than 30 years of experience. Like most ABEM physicians, my practice has been primarily in the urban setting at level one and level two trauma centers, but I've always made it a point to have a component of my practice in the rural setting, and now that represents about 50% of my clinical time. In that setting, I've had an opportunity to work with some terrific PAs and MPs, as well as physician colleagues from other specialties to provide that quality care that's needed in this setting. We all recognize, however, that there is a lack of parity in quality of care in rural EDs as compared to their urban counterparts. In this podcast series, we're gonna drill down as to the reason why and look to organizations that are looking to improve that quality care through better onboarding processes. Organizations such as the Society of Emergency Medicine PAs, the American Academy of Emergency Nurse Practitioners, and the American Board of Physician Specialties Board Certified EM Track, and what those physicians are recommending. We're also going to look to health system leaders and to leaders of private physician groups and how they've pioneered new onboarding practices to improve rural care in their settings and in their groups. So without further ado, let's join one of those discussions now and let's learn how we can provide better care for our rural ED patients. Thank you. Welcome to this EMCT podcast on the topic of onboarding in emergency medicine and emergency medicine education. Our guest today is Tom McAnally, uh, president of SEMPA. Hello, Tom. Dr. Jamison, how are you? Good Very to see good. You, as always. <laughs> Pleasure to talk with you as well. Uh, we're going to get on a subject today that's near and dear to both of our hearts, and that's onboarding and education in emergency medicine. I understand and I, I know from our discussions and working with your SEMPA colleagues that SEMPA has a strong interest in emergency medicine education, and it's what sets you apart in emergency medicine from those who just migrate into the field and, and work there versus those who really have an interest in making emergency medicine their career and striving to provide the best patient care that they can. So I want to uh, start our discussion with, first of all, uh, the traditional role of how PAs uh, found their way to emergency medicine and and what was your journey in getting or getting comfortable in the practice of emergency medicine? Where did you start and how did you feel right out of your training? And, and how long did it take for you to get grounded in this profession? Uh, that's a good way to start. Um, <laughs> PAs have been in emergency medicine nearly since PAs have come into existence in the late 60s and have always had a part in the emergency department. Uh, right around the same time that emergency medicine was becoming a specialty. And so uh, our paths have uh, gone side by side for uh, 50 years. And uh, that growth, I think, makes it an ideal situation for the PA in the emergency department. We've been there since the beginning. and. Uh, are are well set up. For me personally, uh, I spent the first part of my adult life as uh, as a paramedic and doing EMS, and uh, was a flight medic as well. And uh, that happened before my PA training. I attended OHSU, which is one of the finest uh, PA programs in the country, and uh, from there. Uh, got a, a real good taste of rural medicine during my rotations there, but emergency medicine was definitely in my bones and in my bone marrow. And when I uh, uh, finished my last rotations here in Colorado, uh, I was able to secure uh, an emergency department job. And um, from there and since 2000, have, I've been practicing emergency medicine in Northern Colorado. Um, one of the great things in my career that uh, that I've had the advantage of was an extremely good mentoring team of emergency physicians who 
uh, took me where I was with my experience, education and training and grew that to the point where um, most of the time these days, uh, we don't have to talk about many patients at all. Uh, certainly there's obligatory consults that we need to get and have them see those patients in the emergency department. Um, but by and large, when the emergency physician is stuck in the recess room, uh, my group uh, is reassured by the fact that, uh, you know, a highly, highly trained and vetted PA is taking care of the emergency department. And that's not just me individually. It was my colleagues. I worked with one of the <clears throat> strongest group of PAs, excuse me, <clears throat> that all had extensive experience and were vetted by the same model. Uh, and there was a group of four of us. Uh, and um, it, it was a very efficient model uh, and very good work and relationship with our emergency physicians of that group. Nice. Well, and, and you're highlighting the traditional model of onboarding in emergency medicine is working side by side, emergency medicine trained physicians and gaining that experience in a in a larger volume facility. And the PAs that, that we've worked with um, that have become very strong have followed that same model. Now, some want to practice the entirety of emergency medicine and get in the resuscitation bay. Some want to stay in the less acute areas. Uh, and we tried to accommodate those interests, um, but wanted everyone to strive to, to work to the uh, their entirety of their scope of practice um, and be able to see those complex patients. And then, you know, um, as they gain more confidence, uh, they would come to us later and later in the workup and, and let us know what was happening with those patients. And as happens in the majority of emergency departments across the country, there are some lower acuity patients or patients that you feel confident with that are managed entirely by the PAs that what you see? Definitely. And uh, five years ago, I changed to a different group. And that the group that I'm with now um, has a bit more. And a part of this, I think, was due to CMS billing and coding causes. But uh, uh, about five years ago, they started seeing more and more of uh, the patients that were managed by the PA. And uh, we get that. Uh, and you're right. Many PAs will uh, gravitate to the lower acuity side, uh, you know, the, the orthopedic stuff and the lacerations and really thrive on that. Whereas others uh, enjoy complicated internal, internal medicine, um, you know, uh, unstable patients with vital sign instabilities, uh, uh, you know, acute care trauma cases and Others will gravitate to that side, and um, all PAs in the emergency department, I believe, should be competent in that and have some experience with it, even if they're going to work primarily in the fast track, because what inevitably happens in uh, minor care and fast track areas is somebody's missed triage, and all of a sudden, you have a fellow who fell off his motorcycle and he's got rib pain his heart rate's 110. And what do you find? You find a lacerated spleen. And that doesn't belong in the fast track at all. Right. But if you don't have the experience uh, uh, having that on your differential diagnosis, even in the fast track, you're going to miss it. And so to have that experience in the main emergency department with unstable patients and with acute care emergencies, um, uh, you'll miss those cases in the fast track that, uh, and that can be problematic. Yeah, no, I've uh, spent time in fast track as well, alongside our PAs, sometimes, you know, seeing them when that's the busier area, not the main department. And I saw a 70 year old gentleman who was out on his tractor and he thought he had a back strain from being on his tractor all day. <laughs> um, but I couldn't find any tenderness in his back, laid him down, he had a triple A. 
and it was 10 centimeters yeah. nearly ruptured. Um, so, yeah. or, or is rupturing part to peritoneal and he didn't know it. So no, there, are, you need to have a broad differential um, for yeah. that. Additionally, at our larger volume facility, where I do half time rural, half time larger volume facility. And at our larger volume facility, there is some reluctance you can imagine for emergency physicians to want to work as many night shifts as are required because we're there 24 seven and and having a PA with us overnight uh, was very beneficial. And I, I would say we had PAs and end and uh at our practice, but having our APP with us overnight uh, required that even though we are in the trauma bay and and you may be the only one out on on the main floor as we get into the wee hours of the morning, three or four in the morning, uh, sometimes there are two and three trauma patients that come in and you may be initiating the resuscitation until the physician can get freed up and, and be in that room and doing procedural sedation and all of that. So, it, you know, you may be the only one there for a few hours, depending on the volume of your department. So we really depend on, on those uh, on our APP colleagues to to step up in those situations, and as we adjust scheduling, and and every group has their methods of how they staff. Um, but you know, as you have twenty four seven coverage with a physician, and then you get into that next tier of, of of volume, you can't justify bringing on an emergency physician yet. The next step is usually to bring on an APP and then perhaps another physician and then another APP. And pretty soon, you know, you're adjusting hours around the clock. But there are those times that you're going to have a physician and an APP and a 30,000 volume ED plus um, as the only providers. And we all know that in that setting, you can have spikes in volume that require both of you to be taking care of some very sick patients. And so... It really important, Correct. not only when we talk about solo practice, and we're going to get there <laughs> in low volume rural hospitals, which is really a trigger point discussion, uh, but even in high volume facilities, uh, we really need our APPs to step up and and we need to talk about what that training standard needs to be. And, and right now, every group seems to be reinventing the wheel um, and there isn't one common standard across the board, uh, but the common method of onboarding seems to be mentorship or apprenticeship, probably more appropriately, just working yeah. along somewhat side of someone. And then one of you or both of you decide your comfort level in seeing certain levels of patients um, but where is the competency assessment in that? Um, has SEMPA taken on this, this thought and what a level of training should be for emergency medicine and, and where have those discussions gone? Um, the question was posed to uh, SEMPA probably six years ago uh, as to whether there was going to be an established standard. And the current standards that are out there right now are the NCCPA CAQ or uh, Certification of Added Quality. Uh, and that's one benchmark. But I, I don't know if that benchmark satisfies what we're talking about here, because it doesn't necessarily, uh, if, if folks look through that, it sort of describes a basic knowledge of resuscitation, but it doesn't um, mandate or require uh, competency to be established in uh, resuscitation. And I'm gonna use that word in general because this is what we're talking about. It doesn't mean cardiopulmonary resuscitation, it's resuscitation in general of an unstable patient, whether they be from uh, a, a medicine cause or a trauma cause. and uh, I think that is basically what we're talking about is resuscitation of unstable patients, both pediatric, adult, geriatric. Uh, and so currently SEMPA recognizes that it, that is a topic and it is a topic that we're discussing now and have been asked to by multiple uh, organizations to say, where does SEMPA stand on this? And our most recent uh, policy 
on the practice of the emergency department PA is probably from 2020. And it it's uh it it has suggestions in there in terms of what an emergency medicine PA should be able to do, but there is no firm standard. And so it's a question that we're working as a board in uh, looking at it as an opportunity for emergency medicine PAs to uh, and for SEMPA to uh, take what is now uh, created by postgraduate training programs, because most of those are fairly standard. There isn't a standardizing body that oversees them at this point, but most of them are standard in terms of their um, of the product that they put out, the competency that they claim. Uh, and so how do we take that and match it with a mentorship type model and then provide the product that is required uh, from SEMPA, where uh, we have ramped up our procedures course and we have a point of care ultrasound course. And then we have our annual conference that addresses many of these with several workshops. There's a critical care workshop and then the uh, didactic portion of our conference is always at uh, you know at physician level training, and it's provided by some of the best in the field in uh, in emergency medicine. And so we're our hope is to at some point uh, come together with other organizations and say this is the this is the base standard that we would expect from an emergency medicine PA either coming out of a postgraduate training program or through the mentorship model and maybe create a, uh, you know, a SEMPA certification, if you will. I don't have the proper words for that quite yet, but yes, I've been through the SEMPA program. Uh, we, we did an EM boot camp uh, years ago, and we're going to use some of that um, model to help put this together. And so it's in process right now. And we're certainly uh, willing to have conversation with other stakeholders in emergency medicine with our physician groups, um, AEM, AC, uh, ACEP, and ACOEP, if uh, they're willing to sit down so that we can uh, have a vetted model that uh, SEMPA can stand behind and uh, continue to provide good product. SEMPA has always uh, our, our, the backbone of our existence is our educational program. And all the way from when I was a member in the early 2000s, uh, the educational program has always been top notch because they recognize there is no PA standard of care and physician standard of care in emergency medicine. There's just standard of care. And so we all need to be prepared to, uh, to practice at that level. Mm -hmm. Have you had discussions with ASEP or with the osteopathic uh, ASEP, AOCP, or with AEM? Have they reached out and, and tried to collaborate or have you sent any uh, recommendations to them? Would they be willing to, to step up and, and help craft some standards, do you think, or some guidelines, or is that going to get too controversial? Um, I don't know the answer to that right now. Uh, you know, I guess the short answer to what you first asked is we're still in the reaching out phase. And, okay. uh, you know, you and I met because of the um, the rural section. I think the rural section is interested in something like that. Uh, I think they're uh, speaking realistically about this as you and I are and uh, recognizing that there is not going to be an emergency physician on every street corner, just like there's not a paramedic in every ambulance. And uh, we have to deal with the realities today. We can set an ideal for what could be out there in 10 years, but the pipeline is not full of uh, emergency physicians or medical students uh, to be to provide an emergency physician on every street corner or in every emergency department around the country. And so we do have um, very capable PAs out there who are giving good care that is at standard of care, working together with our physician colleagues. And uh, you were going to talk about this getting into it is the rural medicine and using telemedicine. So 
Uh, SEMPA definitely is wanting to reach out to these groups. Um, I sent an email to um, ACOEP last night, reaching out, and uh, hopefully we can get a little bit of traction and get some teamwork because there's opportunity here for us all to, uh, you know, we've all been battling for the last five or six years. There's some opportunity for us to come together on something that we can all stand behind that's going to be good for emergency medicine patients. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, and I look forward to seeing more of that collaboration as we tried to get started with the Rural Task Force. As you know, I was the chair elect and then chair of the past or most recent chair of the Rural Task Force or of sorry, the Rural Section of ASAP. Um, and you alluded to the Rural Task Force that uh, of 2020, we came with some recommendations um, that we'd like to see get adopted. Uh, but it has to do with uh, onboarding and and we recognized in that task force that our most vulnerable population were patients presenting to the emergency departments um, with volumes of less than 5,000 patients per year, because you didn't know uh, who you're going to see. Some are community physicians that are there. Rarely there are emergency medicine trained physicians, and I mean very rarely, like 2% of the time <laughs> or less. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, we, uh, wanted to look at that, uh, group of who's staffing there and, and, uh, it turns out a large number of, of the providers in those very low volume facilities, the, the model now has gone from the community family physician covering the ED to PAs and NPs. Uh, either moving into the community or commuting there. Um, I do some work commuting, you know, a couple hours or three hours to some of those very low volume facilities in a pinch uh, when needed, but they aren't looking to have me staff it regularly. I help fill in. Um, more of my rural is in more of a 17,000 volume ED or or one in about a, you know, eight or 9,000 um, where they need a physician um, at the very low volume facilities, not only am I not interested in going there on a regular basis because it's longer for me to drive and and frankly, I, I wouldn't make it a big part of my practice. It's they don't really want an emergency medicine trained physician. Um, they're saying they can't afford it. I don't claim to know the numbers, um, but I know that a lot of these rural hospitals are living on a pretty thin edge or financially and they're trying to do whatever coverage they can. That doesn't mean that they're off the hook with regard to having qualified providers. And the um, accrediting body or um, for NPs anyway, had come out with a, a statement and a paper last year that said that there isn't an NP program that you can graduate from that prepares you to work in emergency medicine and whether you are qualified by that state or by a credentialing committee, you should not work solo without specific emergency medicine training beyond what you receive in your NP program. Um, and we'll come to where PAs are at with that in a second. I'll ask you that too. For PAs, what you know, what's your statement? But I just wanted to go on to say that we did a survey as the Rural Task Force looking at listservs through SEMPA, AAMP, through ASAP, through the CALS organization that focuses on rural training. Um, and we asked APPs working rurally, what is it that is required for you to get credentialed at an emergency, uh, an emergency department in a rural area? And the vast, vast majority said it was ACLS, ATLS, and PALS. <laughs> and then you got credentialed. Um, and that made you an emergency provider. And, and that was the bar along with your certification of either PA or NP. Um, we all recognize that's woefully inadequate. And that's where you're talking about, you know, getting some education versus proving competency. Because just having that certification doesn't mean you're ready to take care of a trauma patient or ready to do an intubation because you did a 20-minute station on airway 
in a skills lab <laughs> in ATLS. That's not going to cut it. So the Rural Task Force came up with five recommendations, and it required foundational training, airway experience, team-based uh, education, a period of time at a long or at a high volume facility. And that was flexible depending on where your experience was and whether you're a new grad or not. Um, but some period of time, maybe it's nine months, maybe it's two years, maybe it's five years before you could go and work solo at a low volume rural facility. But the last condition was that you needed to have telemedicine support and the amount of support depended on, again, how new you were there and, and then there needed to be criteria in place to call in certain conditions. And the way you set that up is by having an emergency physician medical director in every emergency department. And that may be that that physician never actually pulls a shift there but oversees the credentialing requirements, who's going to work there, and then make a determination of competency in those other areas. So that's the background that I come from. And the Rural Task Force really tried to create a bar that would be a minimum standard. Now, you know, and I know the the political ramifications of that within ASEP um, as the emergency physician. Um, we feel the gold standard is an emergency medicine physician uh, seeing those patients. There's a very clear educational standard and level of competency set by the American Board of Emergency Medicine and AOBM that you have your residency training and you do your boards, you do your uh, oral and written boards, and then you you gain competency in that way. And that's that's the threshold. And we've fought that battle. But on a practical matter, as you stated, we aren't going to be at these low volume EDs. So how can we help impact quality care at these very low volume facilities where I think very clear by Bennett and, and Carlos Camargo's article that over a 10 year period, we've made very little penetration to the staffing of, of rural EDs, much less low volume EDs. How is it that we can help impact patient care as emergency physicians at these low volume facilities? Um, and one way would be to create this standard. Without ASEP stepping up, and actually setting that standard, which I hope that we can still do, uh, even though it's a politically charged issue, as again, as we know, um, where would, do you see SEMPA going with this? And do you find those solid recommendations? And is there a point that you would think you would get a consensus among your members to say, you know what, this is good for SEMPA, it's good for emergency patients, this is good for emergency medicine. It's good for our relationship with APA, ASEP to have a competency like this. Where do you see SEMPA in that discussion of a minimum standard of education to work solo in a rural ED? I think in the past, there's been some resistance to it. And the resistance is, oh, we just have to go get another certification. And as you know, and you alluded to that uh, even the even the basic trained uh, PA student that comes right out of school, well, they've already been through PALS and ACLS and ATLS and all the LSs. And uh, is that person prepared to practice emergency medicine in a solo environment? Absolutely not. And I, I do not feel that you're going to get an argument from any PA organization that feels like, certainly not from SEMPA, that feels like that person is ready to practice in any setting without mentorship and oversight. And, uh, you know, what it comes down to is how many patients have you seen? And that's what a residency program is all about. It's about getting the volume of patients and seeing the very different things and about establishing competency with those patients. And so uh, SEMPA is definitely interested in continuing to work to 
help up the bar of the emergency medicine PA as by evidence of the product that we offer. And we're hoping that people will see that by the product that we offer, that uh, we're in this for the long haul. To establish a, uh, a benchmark, uh, my personal opinion and my goal is to, um, to carry that into SEMPA this year. And uh, I've been discussing this with my uh, postgraduate education uh, committee chair and how do we take the model that they uh, have in postgraduate training programs and how do we try to uh, marry that with a product that we can offer in SEMPA to those PAs that have been out there for years. And uh, we have started on this with our uh, rural emergency medicine guidelines a couple of years ago, where we laid out a pathway by which, you know, the several different pathways. One of those pathways was postgraduate training program, but another pathway was to obtain uh, these other courses. And then some, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, closely mentored time in the emergency department in a high volume setting <clears throat> such that you get that volume of patients because that is what is required to establish competency. Uh, and you have to have uh, a presumably stable patient go sideways on you a couple of times before you understand the respect for that. And, uh, and so SEPA is very supportive of, uh, you know, a certain number of years of experience in high volume to get those patients. Uh, so it just slipped my mind, but I was going to touch on one other thing. Oh, oh, um, the telemedicine portion of this. Uh, uh, my experience with that in rural Colorado, which uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit. In rural Colorado, the, the facility that I work at was using um, family practice physicians and NPs, and they were struggling. And they changed their model to hiring experienced uh, emergency medicine PAs with greater than 10 years of experience. And what they have found over the last several years, three years now of trial, is that the quality of care that they've gotten from specific emergency medicine PAs that uh, have that experience and that training and that vetting and that documentation that uh, we've intubated you know, 50 times and we've put in this many central lines and there's a there's a guideline that is required for credentialing and what they found is the quality of care has gone up the throughput in the emergency department in terms of uh, uh length of stay and length of stay and uh, appropriate disposition have all improved dramatically and this has improved the lifestyle of the family physicians and uh, NPs in that community because they're not up in the middle of the night and doing clinic. It's a dedicated emergency medicine PA who staffs the emergency department 24-7. Now, part of that practice is uh, the backup of telemedicine and the backup of a family medicine physician who can come in and is required to come in on every trauma or resuscitation. Uh, it may be that they're not there for 20 or 30 minutes, but they're required to come in. The nice thing about the telemedicine is it's a button on the wall and we have an emergency physician, a pharmacist, a nurse, and a respiratory therapist if we need them come right into the room with us. And they're backing up our nurses. They're performing documentation so that our nurse can do hands-on care. And uh, they're providing consultation. They'll make phone calls for us. And uh, as you know, it does go sideways often in the rural area and you need help with critical care when somebody's in the vortex of life or death. And uh, it is very reassuring to have that resource available. Uh, and I, I, I believe it saves lives uh, because oh, we can run a resuscitation like that as if we were in uh, you know, a, a city center where uh, things just go snap of the finger and phone calls are made and 
uh, even though you're hanging on to the patient for six hours as opposed to an hour and 10 minutes, uh, the, the stabilization part is hopefully as ideal as it could possibly be. And it has really improved the quality of care in these departments. And, uh, you know, the group we work with, uh, the physician group has just been absolutely fantastic to work with. It is, it is really a, a team approach to critical care emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, absolutely. No, you hit on some really great points. Um, and uh, not only uh, can it go sideways, but you can end up hanging on to that patient for 24 or 48 hours, <laughs> yep. particularly in these days of troubles with transfers. So uh, you may not only have tele-EM, but tele-IM or hospitalists um, helping you uh, with later stages of management of certain uh, cases um, or or as they're accepting at their facility, but they can't admit them yet, you may be actually talking to the admitting colleagues at the at the next facility, you know, what they want done next. Um, yes, what's, uh, what's available at your low volume hospital, whether critical access or otherwise. Another good point you made with Colorado and your experience is they were able to recruit well-trained PAs um, and, and have a new model. Um, now that isn't an automatic. Uh, there are a lot of rural hospitals out there and a lot are looking to recruit and don't recognize what a well-experienced PA or NP is. Your NP colleagues do that, uh, do it, uh, or have some years of experience as well, do a great job and they aren't recognized either. Uh, so it may be an administrative issue, but it, um, you know, as far as recruitment and, and just trying to get a number of people that were just willing to come out there, but is there a standard that the credentialing committee or these recruiters or the administrators can look at uh, and say, well, you know, I want this PA over that PA or this NP over that NP, or we want this family physician or another, you know, physician at the next tier of, of volume. Um, the American Board of Physicians Specialties has a BCEM track for board certification. They go through uh, oral and written boards, much like um, in emergency medicine. They've done family practice as a background and, and showed their commitment to emergency medicine that way. Should that be the standard for family physicians or other physicians that, that want to work rural and, and be independent? And, and those are all tough questions. The problem is the cart got ahead of the horse, particularly for NPs who have independent practice in half of the United States. Um, they were granted this independent status, but don't have a minimum standard of what that is. And, and I was very happy to see last year, at least that uh, they have come up with a statement that said, no, you're not ready after your NP program. Um, but the same challenge will be put to them as we're talking in this podcast. What are you doing as an organization to make sure you are prepared to work as that solo practitioner? Um, it shouldn't all be on you. There should be guardrails in place and policies set up through other organizations, including ASEP and AAEM and, and, and others that want to uh, influence policy, it should come federally as well. The sort of the condition of participation for critical access hospitals says very explicitly, this is the equipment you need to have, you know, an endotracheal tube, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you need to have trays for putting in chest tubes, you need to have cardiac monitoring. It doesn't even say video laryngoscope, but it has, you know, a urinary catheter. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to provide that down to the urinary catheter. And then the next line or the next condition is you need to have emergency medicine trained providers. They can be PAs or NPs, but they have to be EM trained. And then it stops. It says nothing about what that training has to be. It, and the equipment very clearly laid out what it has to be, but for the training, it says nothing, doesn't even say ACLS, ATLS, and PALS, which is what the credentialing committees seem to pretty broadly made as their threshold for credentialing. 
but there's nothing else that is said there. And I think that's sad that we've gotten decades into independent practice for PAs and NPs at these facilities and don't have that better defined. I, that boggles my mind and it's truly a patient safety issue. And I know we've talked about this before and, and we're both working to raise that bar uh, to for better education. Um, and I really just hope it comes from our organizations, both of ours, to help produce that level for better patient safety in the rural facility. Because we all travel through those areas in our cars too um, and may end up upside yep. down and sideways in one of these EDs. So, Well, and as you were talking, it sort of popped into my head of what would be the certifying body. And I'm, I, I just thought, what about the American Board of Emergency Medicine? Now, it brings up a lot of hot buttons, both in the physician world and in the PA world. Um, why can the American Board of Emergency Medicine not develop a with work from the physician organizations and the PA organizations and SEMPA to come together with and AEMP to come together for uh, a American Board of Emergency Medicine certification, it's already set up and the guidelines are there. Can they be modified? But that also brings into the discussion, uh, you know, why PAs and NPs aren't challenging the USMLE and doing all that. I, I know it brings up a lot of that and there will be a significant challenge there because they haven't been through the training, you know, the didactic training programs, but could there be a coalition of groups to come together underneath the umbrella of ABEM to create a uh, standard of practice for the emergency medicine PA or NP or together or both such that there was some baseline level training and that was just a brainstorm that came into my head. The infrastructure is already there. Uh, uh, I know that there will be significant challenges uh, uh, to that from stakeholders. <laughs> oh, certainly there will be. Um, but it doesn't I think... have to be at the same level. It can be at oh, a step agreed. down. Agreed, agreed. And the Rural Task Force tried to set a, you know, have a set, set a standard uh, for that training and be the leader in education and and in setting that up. And that's what our vision was in the Rural Task Force. Not as not as grand of a, of a proposal as to have ABEM involved, but I think it's great. On the legal and political side, I think that anyone practicing medicine should be credentialed on a state basis by the state board of medical practice, like PAs are. NPs are under the nursing board. I don't see what they're doing as nursing. You know, I learned long ago that there's a nurse model and there's a physician model. Once you become an NP, um, you're no longer practicing nursing. You're diagnosing and treating disease. And, and if you're working independently, you truly are practicing medicine. So uh, that should really be under the Minnesota Board of Medical, or <laughs> where I'm from, Minnesota. I just let that out. It should really be under the medical, uh, the Board of Medical Practice, the State Board, I believe. Um, but again, that's a politically charged issue, and and that's something I'll, you know, talk. We'll have a podcast coming up with our AAENP colleagues um, and their work at at setting a new standard because they've got a lot of irons in the fire in that way and and want to uh, establish themselves as the leader in, in education among their NPs. And uh, truly a noble effort, just like SEMPA is doing as well. Let's focus on patient safety. Let's get out of the fray of the politics and of, of the posturing. Um, and let's just do what's best for patient care and that's really improving everybody's practice of emergency medicine and helping everyone succeed 
in their practice and not try to undermine it by pretending it doesn't exist or or not giving a hand in in setting up some of these credentialing processes. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There, you're right, there is infrastructure there. All we need is the political will. And uh, and I think I see it from the from the PA side. I'd like to see more accommodating from the physician side now. I think we've got half of ASEP there. We just need to get over the hump and and uh, and really reach out and and hopefully get some real tangible changes in place where we can really collaborate to help improve that training. And I'm not saying ASEP doesn't do their part. I, you know, I, I love ASEP. I'm part of it. I've been a member since I've been an emergency physician. I've been active politically with it. Do I agree with everything that happens? No. And, and that's why we have our discussions, you know, of this is how we should do things differently. And, and those become very dynamic at our council meeting every year. And this particular issue is very dynamic <laughs> every year because it it will go back to we've fought this battle. We know that patients get the best care if they're cared for by the emergency medicine trained and boarded physician. Yes, all right. But when we're not there, then what? And then the conversation stops. And then no one is willing to say, well, but we shouldn't have a dual standard in in rural. Well, but there is. So how do we improve that? Because the status quo is not is not uh, adequate, you know, and to not con do continuous improvement is not adequate. So where do we go to take that next step? And that's what I like to see is just have us keep moving on in that way. Well, and, uh, you know, SEPA continues, our leadership continues to meet with ASEP on a regular basis to try to tackle some of these issues together and uh, to try to overcome our relative uh, political issues within uh, our organizations such that we can try to come together uh, and come up with some solutions at, as you say, what's best for patients and what's best for establishing competency because it's not necessarily a matter of the will to have an emergency physician in in every hospital, it's it's the practicality of it, and it's about the availability of resources. And it's just like, you know, we don't have a physician out in every ambulance, and so we are trying to train our paramedics to be the best that they can to thrive in that environment. And we don't have a political issue with that. Right. Uh, the same thing holds true for the rural area. We just simply do not have the resources available to sustain uh, an emergency physician in each one of these hospitals around the country. And if we mandate that there needs to be one, well, then these facilities are going to close and this population is going to suffer. And so what can we do, like you say, to best prepare the people that we have out there and that we have available uh, with competency education and training and uh, benchmarks that uh, we can all uh, sleep on at night to say, yes, we have done a really good thing for these small communities. Because you know those communities like I do. They're, they're a bunch of hardworking people out there. And, I, and, and it is a good community to work in. And, and I, I thrive on giving them the best care that I can possibly give them. Uh, and, you know, if we don't have those physician resources available, can we still give standard of care? My hope is yes. And I think we've been demonstrating that in rural Colorado. Uh, we've got some good data on it. And nice. uh, organizations need to come together and um, and make this happen because it can happen way quicker than uh, the emergency physician pipeline. It's going to be 10 years before things uh, turn around with the match the way it was this last year. Uh, they're going to be struggling and there will always be a need for um, for PAs and MPs in this environment, both in the community hospitals and in the academic centers and in the rural area. And uh, those three areas all need their own focus. No, all true. All true. I'm motivated from SEMPA's standpoint to sit down with anybody at any time and uh hash out some of the difficult things. So Tom, how long is your term yet as president for 
the Society for Emergency Medicine PAs. So I started my term at our most recent conference in May, and we'll go to our next conference in April of 2024. One and then year? Will be, it's a one-year term, yes. It's uh, president-elect, president, and then immediate past president. Um, we've seen good and bad about that. Sometimes it's uh, good just to move through it, and you've got three years to participate and uh, be involved. Uh, but we're seeing a drawback of it because sometimes it's hard to gain traction on uh, on projects. And uh, as you know, in this environment that we're in, that relationships are key. And when we can have those good relationships that some of the political stuff can go by the wayside, you can actually get some traction. But if you only have a short window to do this in, uh, that might impede progress uh, in terms of um, getting some real uh, good policy done. So we've got a lot of work to do in the next few months. <laughs> Let's get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonder what October is going to show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, good deal. Uh, well, I really appreciate us having the time to share our ideals in emergency medicine and share where our vision of the future, where it'll go. Um, I, uh, I'm going to expand uh, this discussion to other organizations. As I said, we have a discussion coming up with AAENP. I'd like to have a representative from the American Board of Physician Specialties that's BCM trained and have that discussion as well as to what drove their interest in uh, creating a, a standard for training in emergency medicine and, and for physicians that want to work in rural areas as well. The Rural Task Force did stratify emergency departments as uh, very low volume. We called them um, frontier hospitals that had less than 2,500 volume. Clearly the volume that you're never going to see, I am never saying never, but you know, you really are not likely to see emergency medicine trained and boarded physicians at those facilities. The next tier was about 4,500, you know, perhaps half patient per hour, um, was the next tier um, where still the vast majority are, you know, the standard really is more for um, PANP coverage at those facilities. And we're seeing yeah. that more and more. Um, and then beyond that, you start seeing the mix of, you know, you start seeing more of family physicians and those that are BCEM uh, by an alternative board other than ABEM and ALBEM. Um, and then around 12,000, you can begin uh, annual volume, you begin to support uh, emergency medicine physicians on the professional fees alone without a supplement from the hospital. Um, so we did stratify it based on, on ability of these facilities to be financially stable. Um, but again, that doesn't get them off the hook for not providing that training. The, it's unfair to put PAs and NPs in that environment without giving the organization guidance. And without giving that guidance, they're going to continue to use ACLS, ATLS, and PALS as their standard for their credentialing committees because that's what's been the standard um, as the tradition was to, was to have some certification of family physicians to go in those facilities. So it's really up to us to educate those administrators, those hospitals, educate the Center for Medicare and Medicaid services on what those conditions of participation for critical access hospitals should be and and uh, and educating organizations, even can contract management groups and and health systems. So it's uh, it's important that we come together as societies and leaders in emergency medicine. And and Sempa is certainly one of those colleagues in emergency medicine that has that leadership role and that ability to to help. Uh, create that standard. So uh, I appreciate us having an opportunity to talk about it. This has been a project of mine for a long time to help improve rural care through education. And and uh, that was part of our development of the emergency medicine core training program. And I'll put that 
<laughs> plug in for it as well as we're sponsoring it. I would like to have the conflict of interest removed, but no one else was really stepping up to produce that kind of a product because it was yeah. a Herculean task of, of many of us from across the country, even our PA and MP colleagues helped to craft some of the um, some of the material that was guided by produ production by the emergency physicians, but they helped us to craft it to fit the needs for PAs and NPs as well. So, yeah. um, uh, well, and that's exactly the kind of uh, education and training that needs to be out there um, to be available to PAs and NPs. Uh, you can uh, do a postgraduate training program in of itself, but without supplemental education and seeing a number of patients, um, the breadth and depth of the knowledge is not going to be there. And if hospital systems are hiring PAs and MPs that are fresh out of school to this environment, this is a total disservice to, uh, number one, those working in those environments, but most importantly to the patients in those environments, because, um, how are you going to recognize that which you've never seen before? Right. And uh, and it takes training and experience uh, to develop that level of skill and intuition to help you thrive in that environment. Right. Yep. Oh, indeed. Well, let's keep up the mission of improving emergency medicine patient care across the board, but with our fo focus on the rural area, Tom, appreciate- Yeah, and I'll uh, do our part to try to get SEMPA at the table and we're willing to sit down with anybody. And um, for ourselves, we're looking at developing what we feel is uh, emergency medicine standards of care and uh, recommended education and training as outlined by our rural guidelines. Uh, we have it for the EMS PA, but we should have it for general emergency department PAs as well. Yeah, I admire your your interest in taking this on, and and I respect SEMPA's position in improving patient care in that way. I mean, educational standards and setting a standard among all PAs and every PA working in emergency medicine should be a member of SEMPA and and support that organization because it really is representing you. It's representing your patients. And uh, and you guys just do a terrific job. I appreciate it. Well, and uh, we need to get uh, EMPAs all involved in SEMPA because uh, you know they have they have a stake in uh, in the profession. And uh, here's where they can exercise their voice. They can participate and they can up the game of EMPAs all around them. Absolutely. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining, Tom. Uh, we'll be in touch again. I know we continually collaborate on things or discuss what's what's latest in emergency medicine. Maybe we can talk fishing sometime too, but uh, this is just too exciting of a topic. So, <laughs> I don't think we should talk about it. We should do it. There you go. Fishing. All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll be, I understand Colorado is good for that. So <laughs> There's, I know a few holes. All right. Good deal. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you.